You guys want to come on in from the foyer? We're going to get started. Sorry if I scared you. That was a little loud. I apologize. Come on in. We'll get started here. Continuing on with our look at the Sermon on the Mount. And this week we are on verse 9. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. God, how it grows us, stretches us, sometimes hurts us, God, because <laughs> we just know that we can't always do it. But God, thank you for your son, for your son who is me that way. God, help us now as we look to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Here we are. Haven't been up here in a while. It's, uh, it's, it's good. It's exciting. I like preaching every now and then. It's fun. The Word is awesome, and I, I love growing from it. I'm just trying to stall right now because, oh, he is here. Okay, we're good. Never mind. I'm not going to stall. Uh, John Piper, who's a name we've heard around here a lot, uh, he explains or describes the Beatitudes as a beautiful description of salvation. He says the, the Beatitudes are that beautiful description of salvation for us. And what he means by that is this. Uh, throughout churches all around the world, there, are, there are, are teachings that aren't necessarily accurate. Uh, they teach that, you know, all I have to do is have faith and I'm good to go. But the Beatitudes show us that being a follower of Christ isn't about a decision that we made 10 or 20 or for some people 60 or 70 years ago. If we look at the last few weeks, uh, the scriptures that we've been addressing, we see things like, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Seeing God, that is our goal, that's salvation. So if Beatitudes are a, a description of salvation, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see of God. If you want to see God, you have to be pure in heart. Prior to that, we had blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Mercy is salvation. It's grace. It's love. So the Beatitudes show us what the action is when James talks about faith without action is dead. If you want to see God... Well, you have to be pure in heart first. If you want mercy, you have to be merciful. If you want to be satisfied in that lifelong search for, that we all have, right, for satisfaction, well, you need to hunger and thirst for righteousness. The Beatitudes are showing us what salvation means and why we would want it. So before we get into today's uh, verse, We'll read through the whole passage again. So if you want to turn in your Bibles, Matthew 5, 1 through 9, they will be up on the screen. Just to remind us kind of, of what we've been preaching through the last, I guess, nine weeks now. If you have missed any of these sermons, we always post them online. I try to post them by Tuesday, centerpointchurch.ca. Uh, Josh has done a fantastic job teaching through this, and we had Dan Thompson teaching last week. Uh, it's been great. I know for me, it's really been, been stretching. So if you've missed any of these, I strongly encourage you to go to centerpointchurch.ca and uh, check out the messages that you missed. So let's read Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. Here's what it says. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In verse 9, what we're looking at today, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. We came, come to today's verse, verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be sons of God. So what is a son of God? If you're a son of someone, 
whether it's, you know, you're a son of your father, you are a part of that family. So the sons of God means that you're a part of his family. You're part of the family of God. And again, that's that beautiful description of salvation. To be a member of the family of God is to be saved by God. So how do we become sons of God? Well, if we look just prior to it, it says, blessed are the peacemakers. So what is a peacemaker? We hear terms about peace and peacemakers and things like that all the time, especially the state of the world today. So is this a person that just kind of you go with the flow just so that nobody gets upset? You know, maybe at work, if you're a peacemaker, there's a, a proposal that your, your team is working on, and you just know that this proposal is going to flop. Is the peacemaker the person who just sits back and doesn't say anything just because he doesn't want to, you know, start a fight? No, not at all. If you look at Jesus, did Jesus sit on the, line, the sidelines and not stir any pots? Jesus flipped tables. He flipped tables. So he was no pushover. He wasn't the guy that just kind of went with the flow and let the people kind of figure it out for themselves. This passage does not say, blessed are the peacekeepers. A peacekeeper is something drastically different than a peacemaker. Of course, one of the most prevalent places where we hear about peacekeepers today is the UN, the United Nations. Right from their website, it says that their, their job is to monitor and observe peace processes in post-conflict areas and assist com competence in implementing peace agreements. So a peacekeeper is someone who goes into a place where peace is being negotiated and essentially helps to keep that through. They make sure that everyone's holding up their side of the bargain, uh, making sure that, you know, if, if we've made a treaty with someone, you know, the job of the peacekeeper is to make sure that that treaty, uh, you know, gets held. They draw up peace agreements, making sure they're done. And it's a good thing. This is a very good thing. The world needs those people because without them, uh, that we'd probably have war just about everywhere in the world. A peacemaker, however, as we read in this passage, is someone by the default position of their life refuses to let anyone sow seeds of disunity. So a peacemaker doesn't allow disunity. We all know peacemakers. And I'm willing to bet for a lot of us, I know myself, we don't necessarily like the peacemakers. They kind of annoy us sometimes. Maybe they get on our nerves a little bit. Sometimes they might seem like they're a little self-righteous, even though they're not. You know, it's the person, the person you run up to a person uh, with the latest juicy gossip, right? Or they're sitting around the tables at Tim Hortons in Montague. They're not solving the world's problems there, folks. <laughs> They're talking about all the latest juicy gossip about what the mayor did and about what this guy did and what this person did. The peacemaker is the person who goes into that and won't have a part of it. In fact, they hear people, uh, maybe a large group, making fun of a person or ripping on uh, policies or whatever it may be, and the peacemaker actually goes in with this, like, positivity bomb and says, yeah, but did you see what he did for these people? He has such a good heart. And now everyone in the room is like, oh, no. Who's this guy? Ruining our fun. A peacemaker will risk conflict for the sake of peace. A peacemaker will say, you're not having this conversation with me. You go, you work it out with that person, just like the scriptures tell us to. I don't want to be a part of it. You know, when they're saying, can you believe that he did this? No, nope, I don't want to hear it. You go talk with them. Because my experience with that person is this, and I think they're pretty incredible. That's a peacemaker. 
a peacekeeper would just sit there and kind of hear it, maybe not necessarily respond, but they would hear it. A peacemaker doesn't want to have any part of that. While these people may bug us, and I know, as I said, they can sometimes get me, because sometimes you want to take part in that juicy gossip or that complaint or whatever it may be. While they may bug us, we are all supposed to be that person. If you call yourself a Christian, a follower of Christ, you are called to be a peacemaker. You are called to be the person who throws in that awkward positivity bomb in the room that makes everyone uncomfortable. If you want to turn to Psalm 55, Psalm 55, it won't be on the screen, so you may want to turn there. Verse 9, it says, Divide their tongues, for I see violence and strife in the city. Do you guys know what city David's talking about here? Anyone? He's talking about the city of God. And he's saying, Divide their tongues, for I see violence and strife. The strife and violence didn't come from invading armies. It rose up from among the people of God. Verse 12, it says, it's not an enemy who taunts me. Then I could bear it. It's not an adversary who deals insolently with me. Then I could hide from him. It is you, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together within God's house when we walked in the throne. David speaks words here that, are probably well understood by anyone who's maybe gone through, uh, you know, betrayal in a marriage or a business partnership or even in your church. He's pointing out that the people closest to him are the ones who he's having these, these conflicts with. My companion stretched out his hand against his friends. He violated his covenant, his speech, was as smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. As Christians, we are called to peace. 1 Corinthians 7.15 says, For he has called you to peace. If you belong to Jesus, this is your calling. God calls you to contribute to the peace of your family. Look at your families. Picture your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your daughter, These are family. And sometimes we don't get along with family, right? Sometimes we're arguing. Sometimes we're feuding, whatever it may be. However, the peacemaker, the true follower of Christ, is called by God to be an influencer of peace in that environment. It's the same in your church right here. As a member of a congregation, God calls you to contribute to its peace. It's not an option. He's not saying you can do this if you want. God himself says that we are called to peace. So in your church, when you see these things rising up that might create uh, conflict, it's your goal as, as a member of this family to be an influencer of peace in those situations. It's the same in work. You have a job that you go to, a community that you live in. Maybe you go to a restaurant there. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you do, if you are a follower of Christ, he has called you to peace, to be an influencer of peace in your communities, in your families, and in your environments. Proverbs 12 says that those who have peace have joy. Since this is a calling of God, we need to be intentional about pursuing it. Plan peace. If you don't have it, then you should be asking, what is the best way to get it? Who are the people in my life who are influencers of peace that I can learn from? How do we protect it when we do have it? Make sure we don't lose it. The Bible talks about peace. Uh, in the, the original language, the word was shalom. 
And when we say peace today, you know, we think about happiness, and, uh, you know, there's no war. Maybe we're not fighting with our sister, and so I'm, you know, I'm at peace with my sister, whatever it may be. But the word shalom actually, uh, it's more than just the absence of conflict. It's active enjoyment of all that is good. So if we're called to have peace, shalom, if we're called to plan for peace, that will be an active, not just, not just lack of conflict, not just, oh, you know, I didn't have anything stressful to worry about today, but it's an active enjoyment of all that is good. What do I need to do for myself to promote that peace? What do I need to do in my life to be an influencer of a peace that isn't just void of conflict, but is enjoyment? When you come to church, you know, is it a place of enjoyment? Is it a place where you feel that shalom that is talked about in the scriptures? So what, uh, how, do, how do we get it? How do we get peace? What is God's way of making peace? He, you know, he, this, the scriptures are pretty clear. It tells us kind of how we, we, we live our lives. So if, if we're called to peace, surely he must also give us the steps on how to get that peace. And if we look at Jesus, first and foremost, the example is to not stand on your rights. Jesus' right as a, as a person was to live, to, be a, you know, to go about life the way that we all do. And if he stood on that, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be gathering in a church. Instead, Jesus put aside his rights and was sacrificed for us. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, if God stood on his rights and dignity upon his person, every one of us would be consigned to hell and absolute punishment. So if Jesus had stood up and you know, said, it's my right to do this, we would all be, you know, punishment and hell, as he explains. We live in a world of rights right now. It's my right. It's always my right to do stuff, whatever it may be. It's my... Right, and there may be times when it is appropriate to stand on our rights, to insist on our rights even. But if we look at the example of Jesus, the road to peace, to shalom, to active enjoyment and all that is good is to put aside our rights for others. That, that idea of going into conflict or going, going in uh, risking conflict for peace. Next, we're to move toward trouble. Not all trouble. You know, there are some people that love trouble. They love, you know, there's an argument going on and they want to get involved. Our calling is to act as peacemakers. Where you can be a peacemaker, you will move toward the trouble. That's what God did in the incarnation. He moved toward death for us. Peacemaker does not mean avoiding conflict. Peacemakers will risk conflict to try and resolve it. Christ came to make peace between man and God. He moved toward trouble, but then when he came to the trouble, accepted it. That'll often be the experience of the peacemaker. Peacemaking is not for the faint of heart. It takes a lot of courage to be a peacemaker. Peacemakers generally stand out as kind of the odd person in the room. Nobody necessarily wants to have an active relationship with them because they don't, you know, we, we want to be able to gossip and we want to be able to, you know, complain about work or whatever it may be, but the peacemaker is going to come in and squash that It's probably one of the most dangerous worlds in the jo or jobs in the world, and for Jesus, it led to death. And then finally, love before you're loved in return. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5. Could you do that? 
Could you love and keep loving even when love is not returned? Individually, no, we can't. It's not in our nature to love when we're not loved. It's through the Spirit of God that we can. It's through His love, through His sacrifice, through His peace that we can. I'm going to close with a prayer here. Uh, it's from St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, it's an old prayer that was eventually turned into a hymn that you're all probably fairly familiar with. Uh, it's about peace. It is about a call for peace. I'm going to ask you guys if you'll stand. It's going to be up on the screen. And we can say this together as a closing prayer. And hey, we get out of here a little early today because Chris is preaching. So that works out really well. Dave, if you want to come up, we'll get ready. And here we go. It says, make me a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring your love. Where there is injury, your pardon, Lord. And where there is doubt, true faith in you. O Master, grant that I may never seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love with all my soul. God, we thank you for your peace. God, help us to be the peacemaker. Help us, God, in our relationships as they grow. God, that they grow closer to you. In Jesus' name.